in saying that I want to talk with you about gender, I have already run into a problem. What do we mean by this term? And what do others mean? Has its meaning ever been firmly established? The answer is no. The term emerges into a field of contestation about its very meaning and use, subject to coinage and translation as it moves from one discipline to another, from one language to many others. In other words, gender has never not been a contested term. Whatever gender is, it is a field of contestation. In fact, no definition of gender can ground the field of gender studies. We can, however, present a range of approaches and delimit a field of methodological debates. Indeed, that way of proceeding demonstrates what is actually true, namely that gender studies is interdisciplinary by definition and that the ontological question, what is gender, may not be the right question at all. One challenge posed by the anti-gender ideology movement um, is, uh, is whether or not um, the idea of gender that those critics represent uh, is similar to any idea of gender we would find within gender studies. How is a conversation to take place under such circumstances? And what chance is there that any agreement or adjudication can be accomplished when there is no agreement on terms? It is nearly impossible to bridge that epistemic divide with good arguments because many of those who oppose gender refuse to read in the field of gender studies. Indeed, some who oppose gender do not read books in gender or feminist studies, queer or trans studies, queer of color critique, black feminism, or any version of race theory. Indeed, for some, they will not read those works and they don't believe that others should read them. In their view, and I concede that this is a generalization, gender is a singular ideology by which they mean a false way of knowing that has captured the minds of those who operate within its parameters. Some of those critics believe in censoring such texts because they do not belong in schools and only do harm to those who read them. At such a moment, we can see that the term gender or whatever gender stands for is imagined to have enormous power. It is understood to capture the mind, exercising a seductive force, indoctrinating or converting those who come under its power. For instance, those who follow the Vatican, both the last and present Pope, have been told that gender is a diabolical ideology. That is, to read works in gender studies would be tantamount to trafficking with the devil. In such cases, reading is tantamount to ideological seduction. So if any of us start to read one of those books, we would then be taken in and taken over. Thus, more than one protester in the groups I have encountered, when asked whether she has ever read my work or the work of my colleagues, has made clear that she would never read such a book. This raises the question of whether we could ever have a debate about what we have read, as we often do within the classroom, in high schools, colleges, or universities where such topics are discussed. If we have to debate about the value of books that some people refuse to read, then the debate is not very useful unless we debate first about the value of reading and the possibility of reading any text critically. If some of them read the Bible as if it were, manifest truth, refusing, by the way, the rich tradition of biblical hermeneutics, then perhaps they imagine that gender studies people, whoever we are, also read in such a way that we accept and internalize all that we read. They are imposing a literal approach to biblical reading on those of us for whom reading, 
broadly construed, is a critical exercise. By critical, I do not mean negative, but only an approach that asks about unacknowledged assumptions and unwitting consequences that considers how a text is crafted to understand what effect it may have, that considers what is true or false in any given text, along with what is useful or not for understanding social reality or the world we live in. The opposition to gender is not always based on a refusal to read, but sometimes it surely is. And this matters in part because reading in thoughtful ways, examining premises and presuppositions, considering how a text is made and to what end is part of what happens in the humanities and the university more generally. Thus, perhaps we can conclude that the opposition to gender of the sort I have been describing is bound up with an opposition to reading critically and by implication, an opposition to the idea of the university, its role in cultivating critical thought, informed judgment, open inquiry, and open debate. It is surely worth asking whether advocates of the anti-gender position, those who regard gender as an ideology, are to some extent committed to not reading critically because they imagine that reading is an uncritical exercise for themselves and their opponents as well. Reading, in other words, is a submission to the authority of a text considered authoritative. On the one hand, they imagine that others read gender theory as they read the Bible, or as they accept those readings that authorities provide. Thus, gender theory relies, in their view, on wrong-headed texts authored by false authorities who exercise a rival and parallel power to compel submission to their claims. On the other hand, the opponents of gender may well imagine that gender studies students and scholars emerge in forms of critical reading, which would imply calling into question the very textual and ministerial authorities they accept without question. If it is this last point that proves to be right, then presumably those who engage in gender studies also tend to engage in forms of critical reading. The refusal to read the texts they oppose on the part of anti-gender ideology um, representatives makes sense if the only way they can read is uncritically. If what they read, they must take in as true, then yes, they cannot read gender studies. This, refu this refusal suggests that they, only, need, they know, only know how to read uncritically. And if uncritical reading of their authoritative texts is what they defend, then they are part of a broader anti-intellectual trend marked by its hostility to critical thought more generally. All of this leads me to wonder whether the argument we should have, if arguments were possible, is about reading. For what kind of reading do we do in the field of gender studies? Although gender is sometimes characterized as a single theory, uh, in France, they call it la, la théorie du genre, there has never been one theory. One tactic of the opposition is to reduce a complex and contested field of inquiry into one single idea or a slogan. And that single idea is meant to stand for and efface the burgeoning complexity of the field. In fact, the very existence of gender studies depends on an array of texts, objects, and archives, a wide range of methodological approaches and theories that are not simply accepted as such. They differ from one another. They have to be read comparatively and critically and scholars and students have to come up with their own view and defend it with arguments and evidence and decent logic. And yet gender studies is said to be an ideology inculcated into the minds of youth, indoctrinating akin to totalitarianism, if not the new totalitarianism. In some versions of the critique of gender, it is figured as the means by which students are instructed on how to become gay or lesbian, or it is a mode of seduction, even a practice of pedophilia, thus a mandatory prescription and conversion 
we can and should dismiss all these false caricatures and make clear what gender studies does and does not do. But the problem that we have before us is one that argument alone cannot solve. For in all of these cases above and many more, we are in the face of a phantasmatic scene, a specter. By phantasmatic scene, I adapt the theoretical formulation of Jean Laplanche for thinking about psychosocial phenomena. For Laplanche, fantasy is not simply the product of the imagination, a wholly subjective reality, but in its most fundamental form has to be understood as a syntactical arrangement of elements of psychic life. Thus, fantasy is not just a content of the mind, a subliminal reverie, but rather an organization of desire and anxiety that follows certain structural and organizational rules. Much could be said psychoanalytically about the distinction between conscious and unconscious fantasy, but here I would only suggest that the organization or syntax of psychic life is at once social and phantasmatic. Although Laplanche was interested in infancy and the formation of what he called an original fantasy, I am asking whether we can appropriate some aspects of his view to understand anti-gender, the position of anti-gender as a phantasmatic scene. My wager is that we will be better able to respond to this movement and its discourse by framing the matter this way. For when the scene is set and something called gender is imagined to be acting on children, academics, or the public in nefarious and destructive ways, then the term gender is acting as both a substitution for a complex set of anxieties and an overdetermined site where the fear of destruction gathers. I guess it is a perverse form of flattery to imagine the contagious and powerful operation of gender, and yet the power attributed to gender is not generated by gender studies or any of its theories. Indeed, I would suggest that these various fantasies of what gender is, especially its power, are bundled into an inflammatory syntax in which some foreign element um, so I've suggested that gender is imagined as a colonial imposition or a foreign intrusion, sometimes the imposition of a foreign power or the entry of an unwanted migrant. But gender is also imagined as an ideology that relies on indoctrination as its mode of operation and, that, and, and denies either material reality or the fact that material reality is God given. Gender is also said um, to permit or enact pedophilia, a form of unwanted seduction of the youth. For some, gender is a concept based on the denial of material reality, the facts of sex themselves. And in this way, the right-wing opposition to gender joins the gender critical movement, which as you know, is not critical in any way that critical theory would accept. To take up this criticism, we will need to consider how gender studies has approached the materiality of the body or even the construction of sex itself. But let me first tell you a little about the history of the phantasm that I am describing, the phantasm of gender. The Vatican's discourse on gender intensified its phantasmatic power within contemporary politics. As a fearsome and destructive phantasm, gender is difficult to, dis to discuss it must be dispelled like a demon or destroyed like a plague or criminalized like a child molester. How does one argue with opponents under such conditions? The answer is doubtless to study the phantasmatic nature of the term as it has been constructed and circulated in order to ask, what are we really talking about when we talk about gender today? If we act as if gender is the only problem because gender is named, then we fail to take into account all the social anxieties and fears that have collected at the site of gender. But if we say that the debate about gender is really about something else, then we fail to account for why those anxieties collect in the way they do 
organized by their specific syntax at the site of gender and not some other place. Yes, what is happening with gender studies is also happening with critical race theory and ethnic studies. So we should clearly also be aware of the opposition to critical thought more broadly, that is to forms of thought that illuminate, say, the systemic character of racism, the compulsory forms of gender regulation, and the pathologization or criminalization of LGBTQI lives. The anti-intellectualism, the failure to read, to discuss, to affirm an open form of inquiry is also, as I've suggested, an attack on the academy, the idea of the university, the idea of what a university open to the public concerned with public life should be. Although the movement against gender has many religious dimensions, it is not always a religious movement. A secular group in Bordeaux protested me once because they claimed that I did not believe in science. I do, by the way, and I'm double vaxxed and boosted, and philosophy of science is one of my favorite fields. But sometimes what is called science is either natural law, stipulating the differences between the sexes on the basis of the Bible, or positivism, which does not account either for how observation is socially formed, inflecting the object that it sees and records, nor in what way social norms craft the human morphologies that are legible to us. For some Christians, natural law and divine law are the same. God made the sexes in a binary way, and it's not the prerogative of humans to remake them in any other way. Of course, some feminist scholars of religion have disputed this, suggesting that the Bible has some conflicting views on this very topic. We could say that this is older science and it holds to the proposition that sex differences are established in natural law in the sense that the content of that law is established by nature and therefore presumably has validity everywhere. That law does not change by virtue of positive law, but positive law, the law established by humans and codified by humans, should be grounded in natural law and not defy its precepts. Since nature is itself established by God, the argument goes, to defy natural law is to defy the will of God. What follows from this set of beliefs is that if one has a will or acts willfully, then not only does one defy God, but one has presumably taken over his will. This is but one of the Christian points against gender. And as I presume you know, the Fuhrer began some years ago when the Pope's family council, then directed by Joseph Ratzinger, warned that gender theorists were imperiling the family by challenging the proposition that Christian family roles could and should be derived from biological sex. It was, according to the Vatican, in the nature of sex for women to do domestic work and for men to undertake action in employment and public life. The integrity of the family, understood as both Christian and natural, was said to be imperiled by this gender ideology. Ratzinger first made public his concern at the Beijing Conference on the Status of Women in 1995 and then again in 2004 as head of the Pontifical Council on the Family in a letter to bishops underscoring the potential of gender to destroy feminine values important to the church and the natural distinction between the two sexes. As Pope Benedict, he went further in 2012, maintaining that such ideologies deny the preordained duality of man and woman and thus deny the family as a reality established by creation. Because he argued man and woman are created by God, those who seek to create themselves deny the creative power of God. And they assume that they, those self-creating sorts, they have divine powers and they are misled by an atheistic set of beliefs. By 2016, Pope Francis, despite his occasionally progressive views, continued the line developed by Pope Benedict, but sounded an even stronger alarm. We are experiencing a moment of the annihilation of man as the image of God. 
he specifically included as an instance of this defacement, the ideology of gender. And he was clearly outraged that, and I quote, today children, children are taught in school that everyone can choose his or her sex and this terrible. Then he made affirmative reference to Benedict and claimed God created man and woman, God created the world in a certain way, and we are doing the exact opposite. In fact, he says that in 2017. It would appear from this perspective that humans have taken over the creative power of the divine. And Pope Francis has gone further to argue that proponents of gender are like those who support or deploy nuclear arms and that their target is creation itself. This suggests that whatever gender is, it carries enormous destructive power in the minds of those who oppose it. Indeed, an unfathomable and terrifying destructiveness. It is represented as a demonic force of destruction pitted against God's creative powers. For the current Pope, this phantasm called gender is both diabolical and ideological. Diabolical means comes from the devil. It is the devil's work and so does not emerge from the divine, is not part of divine creation. To the extent that gender is understood by the Vatican as a doctrine that claims that one can create a gender one was not assigned at birth, the form of creation for which gender stands is a false and deceptive one. The divine is the only one who has creative powers and the divine created male and female, or so it is said. If anyone departs from the sex that has been divinely created for them, they are stealing and destroying the creative powers that belong solely to God. Diabolical also means that the vulnerable and susceptible will be influenced and indoctrinated by this ideology that flies in the face of Christian doctrine. The devil or the demonic more generally works to entice, influence, inculcate, and groom, exploiting the youth and others who are susceptible to believing in the new powers of self-definition provided by something called gender. It actually does not matter whether a trans person claims that their gendered truth is internal, even God-given, as some trans people do, or whether they are hyper-voluntarists who believe that gender can be chosen and defend their rights uh, as expressions of personal liberty. In fact, trans people have a number of different ways of explaining why they are trans if they choose to explain why they are trans. Some people don't feel the need to explain at all. Either way, they claim a gender for themselves that was not the one originally assigned at birth. And they do exercise human powers of self-definition at the expense of what is called natural sex regarded as divinely created. According to the Vatican, they are acting as if they have divine powers or they are disputing the power of divinity to decide their sex. At some points, the Pope declares that gender advocates seek to steal the powers of God, thus confer confirming that they work for the devil. For the devil always disguises himself in a mesmerizing appearance. And if gender is such a devil or the devil himself, then to argue with him is to fall inside his trap. So it's not just that the anti-gender movement fails to read or refuses to read. The problem is that if they were to read, they would be touched and transformed by what they read, or they could be, and that would be to put themselves in the presence of the demonic, at least that is their fear. Reading thus becomes a form of contamination. Devils and demons can only be expelled or banished, burnt in effigy, which is why censorship and pathologization become the key strategies for the anti-gender movement. Oddly, gender theorists are not considered to speak reasonably since they are themselves mesmerized or indoctrinated, which means that we are the ones in their view who cannot be argued with. Apparently, we speak dangerous nonsense. The epistemic break between gender, gender advocates or gender studies practitioners on the one hand and the anti-gender ideology movement on the other remains something like a war 
unless the phantasmatic enemy can be reduced to its living proportions, unless we find a mode of arguing that addresses the deep-seated dynamics, the excitable syntax of the opposition. For we can say truthfully that the aim of gender studies is not colonization, indoctrinate, indoctrination, seduction, or totalitarianism, but our, our words will fall flat unless we can engage these phantasms as we counter these false accusations. Well, let me in the time that is left, take up a couple of these accusations and discuss them. The first one is, is gender a cultural imposition? Is it an imposition of colonialism? Is it a form of imperialism? Is it perhaps an American export a cheapening of a local culture by an overwhelmingly commercial culture? Is it a bit of merchandise for sale or a new kind of market overwhelming and erasing local values? Well, the current Pope has claimed that gender is an example of colonization imposed upon poor local communities. But one problem with his view is that it imagines local cultures as never having been queer or gay or trans. It is of no interest that gender complexity and range is found throughout indigenous life worlds and that strong arguments have been made that it was actually colonialism and the kind of capitalism that it spawned that established first the binary and heteronormative framework for thinking about and living gender. Indeed, if we consider the work of Maria Lugones drawing on the work of Anabal Quijano then colonial arrangements of the context um, for a wide range of issues that we think of as belonging to normative gender relations, including heteronormativity, dimorphic idealism, the patriarchal family, and the very norms that govern gender appearance. Lugonis describes the process this way, and I quote, sexual dimorphism has been an important characteristic of what I call the light side of the colonial modern gender system. Those on the dark side were not necessarily understood dimorphically, having two distinct forms of bodies always easily differentiated from one another. It was the sexual fears of colonizers that led them to imagine the indigenous people of the Americas as hermaphrodites or intersex with large penises and breasts with flowing milk. But as Paula Gunn Allen and others have made clear, intersexed individuals were recognized in many tribal societies prior to colonization without assimilation to the sexual binary. It's important to consider the changes that colonization brought to understand the scope of the organization of sex and gender under colonialism and in Euro-centered global capitalism. If the latter did only recognize sexual dimorphism for white bourgeois males and females, it certainly does not follow that the sexual division is based on biology. Similarly, scholarship on Nigeria, East Africa, South Africa, and Uganda has demonstrated that gender inequality was introduced through Christian missionaries, suggesting that traditional social relations were in some ways more variable and free than those introduced through colonialism and its civilizing missions. We could go on and certainly should go on, but what I wish to um, establish here briefly is um, that there's a wide range of scholarship that establishes gender relations as one effect of colonial power related to the establishment of racial categorizations clearly in the service of racism. And these positions, however, are distinct from those that the Vatican espouses or that the anti-gender ideology movement espouses. Let's be clear about that difference. The anti-gender position argues that gender is a colonizing force and that getting rid of gender will reverse the course of colonization that it represents and enacts. Decolonial and anti-colonial perspectives claim that colonization imposed oppressive gender norms and new forms of identity classifications that intensified the subordination of women and the pathologization of non-gender conforming queer and intersex people who previously may have enjoyed a form of belonging in their communities. 
So it's one thing to say that gender is a sign or a vessel of colonization and to mean by gender, trans, lesbian, gay, bi, queer, intersex, um, that challenge heteronormativity. In that case, all the marginal and struggling folks are representing colonial power and its cultural impositions and violations. But it's another thing to say that colonial power orders gender in patriarchal and heteronormative ways, and that the resistance to colonization should be linked with the affirmation of queer, trans, and intersex lives. Lugones and others have sought to confirm the way in which indigenous communities have made a place for third genders, for instance, and a wide range of research has discussed two-spirit, the term that describes gender non-conforming peoples in many indigenous and First Nation communities across the Americas. The, co the colonial attack on local cultures thus took form in part as the regularization of gender itself, the imposition of binary gender, and the, rep and the production of a heteronormative framework for thinking about gender. So the anti-gender position wants to heighten those very regulations, and so works in the service of the colonizing process it decries. The field of gender studies, for the most part, or at its best, seeks to understand better how colonization imposed binary gender as an observational imperative it was the only thing you could see, one that suffused medical and legal regulations on gendered and sexual life and were linked with racial classifications suffused with sexual phantasms. Um, the idea that gender is a colonial imposition I would suggest draws upon a more general anxiety about the intrusion of the foreign, right? So there's a reason why anti-gender ideology movement is happening on the right wing at the very moment that anti-migrant politics are also happening. Sometimes that foreign, that figure of the foreign is a colonizer or a totalitarianism or a totalitarian, so genderismus, uh, in Germany uh, says that gender studies is totalitarian, but other times the foreign is the migrant or the refugee who threatens national unity and monolingualism. One problem with this account is that gender entered English as a kind of translation and that there's no theory of gender, no critical use of the term without translation whether or not that translation is implicit or explicit. We may think that gender belongs to English, but it's actually a relatively recent term in English. It doesn't work to describe identity or appearance or um, differential forms of power. It didn't start doing that um, in, until the last 60 years. Um, and I could at another point uh, explain how gender came into English. Um, through the work of John Money, um, who was a um, sexologist who sought to correct intersex um, infants and establish normative genders through surgical means. Um, he was constantly trying to fix gender variants to make bodies gender normative. Um, and his uh, practice, his sexological and surgical pra practice was in my mind, cruel. Um, and a form of gender regulation. But interestingly enough, before he started doing that work, gender never described what somebody was in English. I mean, you couldn't say, what gender are you? That, that would not have been possible in the 1950s and it was barely possible in the 1960s. Um, I think it became more possible as a result of feminist adaptations and criticisms of John Money's work. Um, but let me just briefly say one more uh, comment because I want to leave room for um, questions and I'm aware that I uh, lost the connection earlier and that was really unfortunate. Um, is it the case that gender denies the materiality of sex? Is it some sort of fiction that people impose on reality? Well, let's think about sex as both socioculturally and materially constructed. So a philosopher named Catherine Clune Taylor who makes this argument that, um, that sex is both socially and materially constructed 
Well, what does she mean by that? Um, she makes the case um, that um, uh, the, there are that sociocultural and uh, practices and specific gendered norms um, can affect bone development, um, and that sex differences in muscularity, so frequently identified with masculinity and femininity, are hardly natural, and they those differences can be overcome through shifts in sociocultural norms regarding activity and muscularity, as well as increased access to muscle building exercises, right? Let uh, those born assigned female at birth into the gyms. For those who claim that testosterone levels determine the level of muscularity, and we do hear that argument in Olympic uh, debates, Perhaps we should remember that at least 17% of those assigned female at birth have more testosterone than the average person assigned male at birth. And country clubs and spas um, and access to sports teams make a distinct class contribution to both bone health and muscularity, as does access to health care. So even when we're saying, you know, here are my bodily parts and here are the differences. We could be talking about neuroscience or muscularity or indeed uh, hormones. We are very often talking about sites where biology and social practices and, and histories of normative arrangements are intersecting and co-constructing each other. Um, there's a book by C. Riley Snorton called Black on Both Sides which gives a racial history of trans identity. It was published in 2017. And Snorton points out that the brutal procedures undertaken by Money, Money's gender clinic emerged from a history of gynecological techniques performed on slaves who were deprived of anesthesia and who were treated as experiments in the medical offices of doctors. These techniques of surgery were performed on intersex kids as well as trans people within Money's clinic. And they took the achievement of white heteronormativity as their goal, right? So he would try to correct a body and make it gender normative. But then we have to ask, what is the norm of gender? Well, it's European, it's white. Um, it was certainly not uh, gathered from the uh, global South, nor was it derived from any other kind of racialized um, history. So the production of whiteness and the production of dimorphic idealism that correlates with gender actually work together. Um, I would suggest that gender um, uh, names the apparatus that comes to bear on the practice of sex assignment, which is why sex does not precede gender as some natural surface or site of potential cultural inscription. We, I don't think we can say sex is natural and gender is cultural. Sex is always the kind of thing that has to be established. Medical authorities, sports authorities, um, legal authorities are have protocols for establishing sex. And when the means of that establishment, that assignment include medical and legal powers, social norms, and even religious requirements, then the process of establishment results from a complex apparatus of power. The term gender doesn't necessarily describe a person, um, or maybe it does when we talk about gender identity or gender appearance. It describes rather the variable apparatus at work in the very establishment of sex itself. Let me make a final remark. As we witness the violent ons onslaught against the people of Ukraine by Putin's government and army and the suppression of Russian dissidents, let us remember how important the idea of traditional values has been to Putin and his supporters. It was written into the 2015 Russian National Security Strategy where, um, that the rights of family understood as heteronormative and patriarchal and the specific values of maternal home care are to be considered primary in Russian life and any attack on those traditional values is an attack on national security. These are security goals, aims worth fighting for. Now, I'm not saying that Putin went to war against Ukraine because of gender. No, I'm not saying that. But 
when Putin likened himself to J.K. Rowling and compared the cancel culture of trans activists to the destruction of the spiritual core of Russian life, he's explaining in part his rationality for war. This means oddly that we're asked to think about NATO and Ukraine as trans activists or as trans allies, an analogy that shows how substitutable the object of anxiety and fear actually is. The aim of Putin's analogy, as I understand it, was to garner sympathy for his war, but it mobilized, and here again, a phantasmatic scene in which the forces of destruction are always coming at him from the outside. The foreign and its influence will threaten national identity and national security. By implication, this prospect of this foreign invasion justifies his horrific, appalling, destructive war. The problem here is not just that gender is a foreign term, but that it is bound up with a fantasy of foreign invasion, the kind that apparently takes the traditional family apart by introducing what? New forms of intimate association, gay parents, queer and trans kids, and also calls into question why the sex assigned at birth should remain the sex assigned throughout one's life. In Putin's view, or within the syntax of his fantasy, gender and transgender in particular attacks the spiritual and national values of Russia. And Russia is thus justified, even obligated to wage war on this Euro-American import. It is figured, gender is figured as a force of destruction, which therefore must be destroyed. Of course, and I repeat, gender is not the reason for this war, but it is part of the phantasmatic justification of war. And as we see, the assertion of masculine shamelessness is part of the effect of this war. Gender politics is threaded through new forms of fascism, nationalism, and war. And so we have to learn better how to struggle against the phantasm before it swallows us. And for that, we need a transversal collaborative mode of thought that can enter, expose, and counter the phantasms that, that threaten to determine the shape and course of our historical future. Thank you very much.